I get chills, you know, because when I was your phone. All right. So good morning, everybody. I'd like to, again, welcome you to Hope Community Fellowship. And, and thank you for coming to worship the Lord with us this morning. If this is your first time with us, then welcome. And if this is not your first time with us, then I'm glad that you're back with us again. So the, the, the parable that we studied, the parable of the unworthy servants, uh, last week was, was in response to a request that the apostles had of Jesus. And they requested of him, increase our faith. Now the parable contrasted the law and how following the law was never going to help them to increase their faith. And he contrasted that with, with having just the faith of a mustard seed. Just a little bitty faith. You know, the, the mustard seed, the smallest of all the seeds. And Jesus told that parable to help increase the faith of the apostles. So then as they, as they resumed their journey down towards Jerusalem, another opportunity came up for Jesus to help them to increase their faith. And as they're walking along, this group of leopards calls out to him and says, you know, heal us. And he takes this opportunity to help increase their faith. He tells that group of leopards, he says, you know, to go and to show themselves to the priests, which by the way, that seems like an odd thing to me because Jesus didn't tell them when he told them, go show yourselves to the priest. He didn't say, that's going to heal you, by the way. He just told them, go show yourselves to the priests. And that's what they did. They take off to go show themselves to the priests. And on their way, they become healed. And one of those men turned back and he ran back to Jesus and he falls on his face. And he praises God and he gives thanks to Jesus for healing him. I believe that was probably a little bit disappointing for Jesus. I mean, Jesus even noted in there, he said, wasn't there 10 of you? Only one man returns. And, and by the way, that one guy who did return, Jesus says he was a foreigner. So he was a Gentile. He was not a Jew. He was a Gentile. But Jesus told that man, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. The man's faith made him whole. It was nothing that Jesus did for him. It was nothing that the man had done. It was simply his faith. Because he believed that Jesus was the Son of God. He believed that Jesus could do what Jesus had told, what he was asking Jesus to do for him. And while I'm sure that this was a great thing for the leper, the leper I'm sure was quite thrilled to be healed, he did this to increase the faith of his apostles. Because that's what they were asking for. Increase our faith. So now after Jesus heals, heals this man, he has a brief conversation as they're continuing down the road. He has a brief conversation with the Pharisees about, hey, when's the kingdom of God going to come? And, and Jesus teaches, after he has this brief conversation with them, he teaches this parable that we're going to actually study today. This is the parable of the persistent widow. You'll find that in your, in, your, in your Bibles in Luke chapter 18. So if you would, please join me there. But before we read this parable, let's go to the Lord and let's ask Him to bless our time studying His Word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, as, as we come before You this morning, Lord, we come with humbled hearts. We come with open hearts, Lord. We come with, with our eyes open and our ears open, Lord. We come to hear You. We come to hear your word, Lord, to see you. We come, we come to receive your word 
into our hearts, Father God. We just pray as we as we study your word that Holy Spirit is moving here among us, Lord, and in our lives and helping us to change our lives and become more and more like our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his precious name that we pray. Amen. Okay, so please join me in Luke chapter 18. We're going to start off in verse 1, which says, And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. So verse 1 here, I want to stop before we continue on this. Verse 1 here, it's an introduction to this parable. And in this, it says that he is teaching his disciples to that they ought to always pray and to not lose heart. You see, and the reason I wanted to stop is because that phrase, and not lose heart, it's key to this entire parable. That we ought to always pray and not lose heart. This is the parable of the persistent widow. You see that Greek word that they use right there that, that, that we've translated into English that says, uh, uh, you know, to not lose heart. That Greek word is akakeo. It's, man, these Greek ones are hard for me. To say. I practiced that all week. I knew I was going to mess this up. And I even have it like sounded out right here. Egg kakeo, that's it. Egg kakeo. And it literally means to be utterly spiritless, to be wearied out, to be exhausted. So in this parable, Jesus is teaching his disciples that they ought to always pray and don't become wearied out, don't get exhausted. The parable itself that he's getting ready to tell us, it's a great example of being wearied out and exhausted. So join me in verse 2 as we continue down. We'll read the whole parable now. Join me in verse 2 where Jesus begins a parable by saying, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while, he refused. But afterward, he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice, so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. So this judge was not a God-fearing Jew. In his judgments, the law and the prophets meant nothing to him. They were not of his concern. He didn't give a judgment one way or the other because the law or the prophets said this and, and he feared God. He didn't give a judgment because of that. He was also not a respecter of men. He couldn't be bought and paid for to hear a certain person's case or to render a verdict in a certain way. He didn't care. And the point to all of this and why we get this information, the point to it all is that this judge, he was not compelled by the normal external, social, or moral influences that we would all be susceptible to. You know, we let these things play into our life and how they influence us. This judge did not. He could care less about any of that stuff. So when the widow comes before him to seek justice, he didn't feel compelled by God's law to give her justice. That widow could not curry favor with him in his eyes because of her circumstances. He didn't care. By the way, just as a side note, remember, we're in the first century AD here where this has happened, and women do not have a voice. Women don't have a voice in first century AD. They needed a man to speak on their behalf, either, either a father or, or a husband or a son 
or a, a near kinsman redeemer. Somebody had to bring their cause before people. But sometimes it was a widow like it is in, in this situation. And she has nobody to bring her cause forward. So she has to go to the judge to bring her cause forward. This woman had nobody but that judge. And he did not care. He didn't care about her cause. And that's it, by the way. That's the end of the parable. That's all it is. We've, we've read the whole thing. It's short and it's simple. You know, we've studied for months now that parables, they're earthly stories with a heavenly message or a spiritual message. The earthly story here is, is pretty easy. It's simple. I say it all the time. You probably do too. Squeaky wheel gets the oil. And that's the earthly message of this parable. But remember what verse 1 says. Verse 1 says that his disciples ought always pray. They should always pray. The spiritual lesson in this parable is to apply the persistency of the widow to their prayer life. And therein lies the rub, by the way. That we ought to pers apply that persistency to our prayer life. And we have a problem with that, you see, because believers, both spiritually mature and those who have not quite developed the great depth, both of those people fail in their prayer life. We ask questions like, how long should I continue to pray? Some people say, I've been praying for years and God has never answered me. Why doesn't God answer my prayers? We can even find ourselves questioning God's goodness. If God is a good and righteous God, why does he allow evil and bad things to happen in this world? And I want to deal with that question first, by the way. And, and I understand, look, I know it's a rabbit hole, but please go down this rabbit hole with me for a minute. And we'll come back up to our parable. But we need to go down this rabbit hole because we need to deal with this first question. Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? And if you don't answer this question, if you can't answer this question in your heart, then these other questions don't even matter, to be honest with you. You have to be able to answer this question. So come down the rabbit hole with me. Let's see how far it goes. The first thing that we have to accept when we're asking that question about why does God allow bad things to happen to good people, the first thing that we have to accept is we are God's creation. He created us. It's true that he created us in his image, but we will always be the creation, not the creator. We are not the creator. In and of ourselves, we are not eternal. We never will be. We're not all knowing, we're not all powerful, we're not all present. But God is. Our Creator is eternal. He is all powerful. He is all knowing. And He's all present. Now at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, we're taught that God is created us to live in a perfect environment with Him. That was called the Garden of Eden. We were created to live in this perfect environment with Him. As a matter of fact, all other creation was created for the benefit of man. 
God created everything for the benefit of man. But sin entered into the world, and now we live in a fallen world that is tainted by sin. After the fall of man, we are all born with a sin nature. Nobody had to teach you how to lie. It came natural. I shared with some, some of you, I think it was last week or whatever, I remember, I, I remember specifically when I was five years old and I stole a little bitty Reese peanut butter thing out of the thing at the store. And when, I, when my mom asked me if I stole it, no, I didn't steal that. Nobody had to teach me how to lie. I see my little grandchildren right now. I ask them, did you do that? No, I didn't do that. Nobody had to teach that. I, I don't recall their parents teaching them, hey, when you get asked a question and you really don't like that question and you don't want it to go that way, just make something up. Just lie. I don't think that their parents actually told them that. It just comes natural to us. We know how to do that. And the Bible explains this for us in Romans chapter 3, in verse 10, and in verse 23. Listen to what it says. It says in verse 10, as it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. That means you, that means me, that means everybody who's ever lived. None of us have ever been righteous. And in verse 23 of Romans 3, it says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned. It didn't take nobody to teach us how to do it. We just did it. It was in our nature. So why do bad things happen to good people? Because we live in a fallen world that is saturated with sin. Every single one of us is affected by sin. Either our own sin or somebody else's sin. And you see, it's other people's sin affecting us that is so difficult for us to understand. Because God is a sovereign God, by the way. He's aware of every single thing that happens in your life. Now, God doesn't always cause the hurt and the pain that's in your life. But He's a sovereign God. He is absolutely aware of the pain and hurt that happens in your life. And He allows it. And that's the problem that we have with is if you're a good and righteous God, how can you allow pain and suffering in my life? Well, the book of Job, the book of Job is a case study on this very question. Job did nothing wrong. The Bible says that Job was a righteous man. But for some reason, God allowed Satan, go back and read that book, by the way. God and Satan actually have a conversation about Job. God allows Satan to do anything that he wanted to Job. Job was a righteous man. Satan said, oh, but you give me my chance. You give me my chance with him, he'll curse you. He only worships you because you're good to him. That's the only reason that Job worships you, because you're good to him and you protect him. And God says, okay, you go ahead. You do your worst to Job, and I'll bet you he doesn't curse me. And God allows Job to be tested by Satan. In one single day, Job loses all ten of his children, all of his earthly possessions and his wealth in one single day. He loses it all. Listen to what Job says at the end of that day. It says, Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
Job worshipped God after all of this happened to him. He fell down on the ground and he worshipped God. So Satan was not happy with that, by the way. So Satan changes his tactics. He's like, okay, I can't get to him through that. And Satan afflicts his health to the point that he is just in excruciating pain. Job's advice from his wife, curse God and die. That's what Job's wife told him. Just, just curse God and die so that this suffering will all be over with. And Job says to her, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God? And shall we not receive evil? By the way, Job does eventually become discouraged and he does question God. And he goes on and on and he asks God, why? Why are you allowing this to happen to me? By the way, God's big enough to have you question him. My God's big enough to let you question him. And God answers Job. And oh boy, does God answer Job. Man, there's like two whole chapters in that book where God is questioning Job. Where were you when I did this? Where were you when I did this? Where were, can you do this? Can you do that? Oh my goodness. Boy, does God answer Job. And at the end of it all, Job realizes what a fool he is to question God. And he says in there, he says, who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. And just as Job said, God's ways are too wonderful for us to understand. When God was speaking to the prophet Isaiah, listen to what God told the prophet Isaiah. He said, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We will never comprehend why bad things happen to good people. We're never going to comprehend it. But for those of us who walk by faith, and listen to what the scriptures teach us. We know that Romans 8.28 tells us. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Even though that's hard for us to understand sometimes. All things work together for good. Which, by the way, brings us back up out of the rabbit hole. We're going to go back to the we'll go back to the parable now. We'll come up out of the rabbit hole and we're going to get back onto the parable. But we needed to understand that because as we continue reading our passage in verse 6, Jesus is going to talk about this. Jesus says, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you. He will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? These verses answer the other two questions that we had. Why doesn't God answer my prayers? And how long should I pray for? First off, God does answer prayers. He answers the prayers of his elect. Those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior. But the answers are not always the answers that we want Him to give us. God answers prayers in three ways, guys. He says yes, He says no, and sometimes He's slow. But He always gives us the answers that, we're, that, that we need. You see, and when God answers yes, by the way, we're ecstatic, man. We're all happy because God said yes. He gives us some guidance, and we go on and we execute that. And we're like, man, look at God working in my life. We all stood up and gave testimony, great testimony today. We gave testimony for 20, 25 minutes, and, and everybody stood up and testified what God is doing in their lives and how they can see that God is doing 
what God is doing in their lives. And that is awesome. That is super. And we have to do that every single week to share what the Lord is doing in our lives. But we get ecstatic when God says yes, and we see him working on our behalf. Sometimes God says no. Sometimes the answer is no. And, and we get confused when this happens. No. God says, no, I don't want that for you. God says, no, I don't want you to do that. And we don't like that answer, no. And then we sit there and we wonder to ourselves, did God understand my question? Did he understand what I was talking about? I mean, doesn't God realize that I am praying for one of his children to be healed? I mean, surely there can't be anything wrong with that. Why is God telling me no? Why didn't God heal him when I wanted him to be healed? Why did he let him die? Why did this happen? Why did that happen? But sometimes God says no. Paul, the Apostle Paul, had to deal with this very same thing. Paul had what he called a thorn in his flesh. And listen to what Paul says when he wrote to, to the Corinthians. Paul says, Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. That's a hard one for us to accept. That God does something to us because he wants to make us stronger. You see, and just as God told Job and Isaiah, we don't always understand his ways because his ways are higher than our ways. It's hard for us to accept when God's telling us no. But it builds our faith. It makes us come to trust Him that He has our best interest at heart. And then sometimes God answers our, our prayers slow. At least it seems slow to us anyway. I mean, to the elect who are crying out day and night. And this is where persistence pays. You see, persistence builds faith. How bad do you want it? Do you want something bad enough that you're going to ask for it over and over, day after day, year after year for the rest of your life? George Mueller is perhaps one of the greatest men of prayer and faith that I have ever read about. Listen to what George, Rule, George Mueller wrote in his journal. He said, in November 1844, I began to pray for the conversion of five individuals. I prayed every day without a single intermission, whether sick or in health, on land or on sea, and whatever the pressure of my engagements might be. Eighteen months elapsed before the first of five was converted, and I thanked God and prayed on for the others. Five years elapsed, and the second was converted. And I thanked God for the second, and I prayed on for the others. Day by day, I continued to pray for them, and six years passed before the third was converted. I thanked God for the three, and I went on to pray for the other two. These two remained unconverted. 36 years later, he wrote that the other two, sons of one of his friends, were still not converted. And then Mueller wrote, But I hope in God. I pray on. And I look for the answer. They are not converted yet. But they will be. In 1897, 52 years after he began to pray daily without interruption for these two men, they were finally converted. 
after George Mueller's death. George Mueller died before he ever got to see the other two converted. George Mueller never saw the full fruits of his prayers. He never saw those two men give their lives to the Lord. But he had the full faith and confidence that his prayers would bring them across the finish line. And it did. But why did Jesus tell this parable to these people at this time? I mean, this parable, again, it's, it's not complex. It's not, not hard to understand. It's pretty simple. I mean, Luke, the author, tells us the purpose right up front in verse 1 that we ought always pray and not lose heart. But why these people at this time? Well, Jesus gives us just a little bit of an indication in that last sentence in verse 8. He says, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? You know that word nevertheless, it means even though I told you this, in spite of what I've just told you, will the Son of Man find faith on earth? When he comes, the apostles had just asked Jesus to increase their faith. And in response to that request, Jesus tells them a parable about the law was not going to increase their faith. And then, and then he showed them by, by cleansing a, a Gentile leper. And then he teaches this parable about persistence. Never give up. Keep on asking and remain faithful and, and persistent, and your faith will be increased. That's why he's teaching this to these people at this time, to increase their faith. Little by little, you'll see God moving on your behalf. I mean, Jesus was on his way down to Jerusalem. He was getting ready to die. He understood what kind of faith it was going to take for those disciples to build the church, the body of Christ. You see, prayer builds faith like nothing else. But it's probably the hardest thing for believers to comprehend. I mean, it's hard to understand because we're ecstatic when we see God working on our behalf and our prayers. But we get frustrated when He tells us no. And then we become confused when we're not sure if he even heard our prayers or not. And by the way, he always does. And then on top of that, you throw in the fact that the enemy, Satan, powers of spiritual darkness battling against us in spiritual warfare are constantly whispering in your ear, God is not listening to you. Why would you even ask him for this? You have no right to ask God for this. You're not even worthy. It's no wonder that almost every brother and sister in Christ that I've ever talked to struggles with prayer. By the way, I'll, I'll be fully honest with you. I do as well. I can write this sermon all day long, but when the rubber meets the road, it's just as hard for me as it is for you. I struggle in prayer also. But listen to what God says in Jeremiah 33, 3. God says, Call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. Listen to what John Piper says. I'm wrapping this up. John Piper tells us, faith is the furnace of our lives. It's fueled by the grace of God. And the divinely appointed shovel for feeding the burner is prayer. If you lose heart and lay down your shovel, the fire will go out and you'll grow cold and hard. Have faith. 
Have faith. Have faith that God hears you in your prayers and that He answers prayers. Be persistent in your prayers. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we do just want to thank you so much, Lord. We thank you that you do hear our prayers. We thank you that you're always there for us, Lord, that you always answer our prayers. Father God, help us to be persistent. Help us to know that you are there listening. Help us to block the other voices out of our minds. Father God, as we, as we go out into this world, Lord, we just pray that you would help us. Help us to love others. Help us to be the salt and the light to other people. We pray all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.